So we're going to turn to our scriptures now. Uh, we're in Matthew chapter 1, reading verses 22 to 24. So if you would, give your now to the reading of God's word. All this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and she will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. And if you would, I'd love it if we could pray together. God, we do thank you for your word. We'd like to thank you especially right now for the revelation of the good news of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, how your, your, your word, how the scriptures are one story and all pointing to Jesus and all glorifying him and, Lord, inviting us to put our faith in him. And so we do, Lord. Even in this moment, Lord, as we consider what you have offered, what you have done, we say yes to the grace of Jesus Christ. And we ask for the application of the gospel to our lives. We ask for transformation. We ask for joy. We ask for wholeness, for healing, and all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So um, we're continuing this series uh, in Advent that I have very creatively called Advent, right? <laughs> I know. Know what you're thinking. He thought long and hard on that title. Um, but, the, you know, the truth is, I thought it was kind of funny, like, wow, this, this really doesn't seem like it took much effort. But I, I really felt like God was, was drawing my attention to just the basic definition of, of Advent, like any Advent, not just Christian Advent, the, the Advent of Jesus. And it is this whole idea of arrival, of, of a notable person and especially drawing I think we're meant to draw our attention to the fact that Jesus his arrival is the most notable in history right that he truly his life death and resurrection is the hinge of history and I, I love the fact that just the way that we mark history kind of represents that right like we we actually track what happens by how far before the birth of Christ it happened or how far after in, in relationship to the birth of Jesus. I think that's so appropriate, but it's deeper than that, of course. That really, the, the fact that Jesus is the hinge of history, it, it is about the fact that he has offered us life. He has opened what is actually, truly life. Not just life after death. I'm talking about life now and life eternal because life is in God and he restores us to God. Truly, his is the most significant, most notable arrival of all of history, right? And it's not even just, this is the cool thing, it's not even just about the first advent of Jesus, but the first advent of Jesus points us toward and fills us with hope about his second advent. If you think about it this way, the scriptures promise the first advent of Jesus, right? And of course that's fulfilled. Jesus has come, fulfilled God's word. But the word also points us to the second advent, the second coming of Jesus. And therefore we are filled with hope because of the advent of Jesus. He himself says that when he comes again, it will mean, it will be the renewal of all things. I mean, think about this. No more, the scriptures declare, no more mourning or crying or pain. No one will harm on all of God's holy mountain. We know, we know that there is a day coming when Christ will come and he will restore all of creation. Heaven and earth will actually be one. No separation. God will dwell in the midst of his people and we will forever enjoy the presence and the love of God, right? This, is, this advent of Jesus fills us with hope as it points us to his second. And we read in the very last, listen, it is literally the last page of the Bible. This is why we pray in accordance with his scriptures at the very last page of the Bible, it says, come, come Lord Jesus, right? That is the desire of our hearts. And, and what we're doing today is we're, we're kind of drilling down, we're focusing on what it means to, to say that Jesus is our Emmanuel. This reality, the Advent means that God has come. He has come. The word Emmanuel that is applied to Jesus, name given to him, it literally means God with God us. God is with us. Now, we, we talked last week, and, and honestly, I don't know why I don't remember this, because when I think about it, um, it amazes me. But did you know, we talked about this last week, every time we say the name Jesus, every time we pray in the name of Jesus, every time we praise Jesus, it is a declaration of faith, right? 
His name literally means the Lord saves. And so when we call on the name of Jesus, pray in the name of Jesus, we are declaring our trust, our faith that he really does save and that we need him, that we are in need of a savior. All of that is wrapped up in the declaration just of the very name of Jesus. And the same is true of Emmanuel. We are making a declaration as this name is applied to Jesus, a declaration that number one, he is God, and number two, that he has come and he is with us, right? He is God and he has come and he is with us. And, and what we're going to do then is just really want us to dig into the implications of the fact that Jesus is our Emmanuel. What does it actually mean for my life and for yours to declare this truth that he is our Emmanuel. And we're going to do this just in three sections, kind of fill in the blank kind of deal. And first of all, what does this tell us about God? What does it tell us about God? God is, and we're going to fill in the blank here. First thing is that God is faithful. This, this is clear assurance that God is faithful. The scripture says, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Now, I, I got to ask you just to hang on for just a couple of minutes with me because we're going to take a little detour and then we're going to come back and I hope it'll make sense. But here's the thing. The scripture declares, God leads Matthew to say, Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah 7. That's where Matthew's quoting from. So what does that mean and how does that point to Jesus? Well, if we look back at the scripture that God says ultimately is pointing to Jesus, originally it was the word of God given through Isaiah to King Ahaz of Judah. Right? So here's the situation. There are two nations who have allied against Judah. They, they are threatening Judah. Uh, everybody in Judah is terrified. They think they're going to be destroyed because now these two nations are coming against the one nation. And God wants them to know. They don't have to be afraid. In fact, God sends Isaiah to King Ahaz because, this is what it says, the hearts of the king and his people trembled with fear like trees shaking in a storm. But God reassures Ahaz. He says, listen, this, this is not going to amount to anything. These, are not, these folks are not going to take Judah down. You don't have to worry. In fact, he says, I, I want to assure you, Ahaz, I want to reassure you so much. I want you to ask me for a sign. And I'm like, man, <laughs> imagine such a thing. If God were to say to you, everything's going to be fine, and I want you to ask me for a sign. He says, quote, make it as difficult as you want. Can you imagine if God said that to you? Any, you can ask me for anything to show you that my word is true. Just, sh just ask me. I will show you that it's true. And Ahaz, he, you know, he tries to kind of act like he's holier than everybody else. And, no, no. I won't ask the Lord for a sign. And you know what the Lord says? He says, okay, I'm going to give you one anyway. Right? I'm going to give you a sign. And here it is. It says that Isaiah's wife will give birth to a son. And they will name him Emmanuel. And that son will be a sign that God is with the people, right? That God is faithful to his word, that they are actually going to be fine. And the scripture says, before he's very old, you're going to see. You're going to see that those two nations are actually going to fail completely. You will see. Just watch and see. The Lord is faithful. The Lord is with you. So then the question is, what does this have to do with Jesus? Why does God say to Matthew to share with us, that this is to fulfill that word through the prophet. What does this have to do with Jesus? And the truth is that this scripture in Isaiah is actually foreshadowing and pointing forward to Jesus. It is a prefigurement of Jesus, and he is the ultimate fulfillment. So let's line these, these two up together. So where, where Isaiah's son, Emmanuel, is born to a young woman, to his wife, Jesus is born to a virgin conceived by the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. You see, he is the ultimate fulfillment of this passage. Where, what we read about Isaiah's son, that he's going to be a sign to the people. He's a sign pointing to the truth that God is with them, right? But Jesus, on the other hand, is not just a sign pointing to the fact that God is with us. He is literally fully, completely God with us. Do you see he, the way he fulfills this completely, ultimately, where Isaiah's son is a sign that the Lord will give them victory in this one situation over these enemies. Jesus is actually our eternal victory over sin, death, and evil. You see, he is the ultimate fulfillment of Isaiah 7, of this passage. And so... Um, <laughs> God says to Ahaz, 
And I believe he's saying to us, you know what, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to worry, right? Do you know, um, the, the most frequent command, this is actually true, people have, have said this, and it's like one of those things, you're like, is that really, it is. Do you know what the most frequent command in all of the Bible is? I bet you do, somebody knows, right? Just call it out. Don't be afraid. It's almost like we're afraid a lot, right? He keeps saying it, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. And do you know what he backs that up with? What he actually empowers us with in order to fulfill that command? Because listen, it does, listen, okay. If somebody just comes up to you and says, Pat, don't be afraid. You're like, um, thanks, like, why? <laughs> Just because you said so? I mean, like, what am I going to do with that? But you see, God doesn't do that. He says, be not afraid, don't be afraid. And you remember what he follows that with, for I am with you, right? He actually enables us to fulfill that command. He gives us the power. He gives us the reason not to be afraid. Tell him, the Lord says through Isaiah, tell him to stop worrying. Tell him he doesn't need to fear. In Jesus, we see the great faithfulness of God. We see that he can be trusted. We can put our trust in him. We can rest in him. Not only that, so we're kind of filling in blanks here. God is faithful, but also God is love. God is love. You know, one of the mistakes that we make in, in how, we, how we understand how God looks at us, and, and I think we all kind of think about this sometimes, like when God looks at me, what, what is God what is God's thinking? What is God's feeling toward me? Honestly, a lot of times I feel, I feel like, it's like, you again? Really? Like, like God's just sort of tolerating me? I don't know if you ever feel that way, but, but here's, here's the thing. We make this mistake so often, I, I think, at least I do. We project what other people think and feel about us onto God. We even project what we think about ourselves, our shame, onto God. We assume things about how God looks at us based on other people and based on ourselves, when in fact, what we're meant to look to, if we really want to understand how God looks at us, how he thinks about us, we are meant to look to Jesus. I want to ask you just to let this reality sink in, that, that the God who who actually created the universe, whose presence spans the universe. If we could see all of the outer edge of the universe, we would not be seeing the outer edge of the presence of God. So that God, that God has located himself in Jesus Christ. He came to earth in the flesh, and why did he do that? He did that for you, and he did that for me. He chose to come into this world. The, the scriptures in Philippians 2 tells us that, that the son, he emptied himself of his divine privilege, took on the form of a slave, of a servant, and he did that for us. And I'll tell you, you know, I, I think the mechanics of that, like, okay, how does that work? And the mechanics of that, really under, hard to understand, maybe impossible to understand for our finite minds. But the love of that is not impossible to understand. It is not impossible to know. We can know the love of God. You see, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what we understand from the Scriptures is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God come in the flesh. He emptied himself of his divine privilege to come to us. Uh, you know, I was thinking about this week um, about my ordination process and, and thinking about the Trinity and the Incarnation. It made me think about my last interview, right? It was the last interview before I was going to be hopefully approved for ordination and, um, and we go into this great big room, and there are all these ordination committee members, something like 60 of them. It felt like, you know, maybe 600 or so were in there uh, to me. And, and, and what they were going to do is divide up uh, into little groups, into little interview teams, and assign each of us to an interview team. And, and so they're going around introducing themselves, and then we're going to divide up. And they get to this one guy that I didn't know, and he says that his name is Ted Runyon, retired theology professor and uh and so i shot up i mean literally i shot up an immediate prayer to the lord lord please in your mercy do not put me in his group 
I mean, I, I didn't recognize him looking at him, but I recognized his name and I had read his theology book. I mean, this guy literally wrote the book on theology, okay? And I'm like, God, I can't take that kind of pressure. And I don't know if you know this, but God has a tremendous sense of humor. He truly does because I went right into his group and... Um, my goodness, in the fir very first question he asked right out of the gate, he says, Jeremy, I want you to explain the Trinity to me as though I were a Muslim person. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's fine. I do that pretty much every day. I mean, it's, it's no big deal. And um, so I started talking about how God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and so forth, and, and, and I'm carrying on. And, and you know how you can just tell by somebody's face, like if you're disappointing them? You know, you're just not getting there. And, and so he finally, he, he said, listen, um, I want you to respond. I want you to tell me how you would respond if, if that same Muslim person said to you that this is heresy. That God, you know, saying that there are three gods, God is one. This is heresy. How would you respond to that? And I said words. I mean, I did. I said like, like legitimate English words, but I don't really remember what any of them were. And finally, to be honest, he just had pity. It was just pity. He just had mercy on me and, and let me go. Um, and, but I'll tell you, the reason I bring that up is it bothered me for years after that because I couldn't figure out what it is that he was looking for. Like, what was I supposed to say to make the Trinity so compelling that even an, an unbeliever would see the beauty and the truth of the Trinity? Like, what, 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 could, what could he possibly be talking about? And it wasn't until I feel like God really opened my eyes to this through a pastor I really admire. His name's Tim Keller. And he was teaching on the Trinity. And certainly he would say, it is essential that we declare that God is one, right? That is absolute essential. But he would say also that it is absolutely essential to declare that God is three. He is one in three, right? And the reason is this. And, and it just, it was like, it's like, oh, God, you're so good. He said this. He said, listen, the Trinity is the only way to make sense of the declaration of the Word of God and really that our hearts know the declaration of the Word of God that God is love. Not just that God is loving, not that God acts in love, but that God's character, His nature, literally defines what love is. The Trinity is the only way to explain that. It's the only way to make sense of it because, listen, before creation, who was there for God to love? And so God could not in his character, his eternal nature, be loving because there was no object of love. There must be in the very character, nature of God, an eternal divine relationship of love that defines who God is. We can say that God is love because he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. And what happens in the incarnation is that God actually opens a divine relationship to draw us into it, to draw us into relationship with him. This is God and this is his love. These are the links which God is willing to go for to have us back. And that really leads us to our next point and our kind of next fill in the blank here, and that is about us. We are, if we fill in the blank here, first of all, we are loved. We are loved. You know, um, the Bible tells us that God's love for us is so great. His love for the world is so great that he sent his son, our Savior, Jesus. He did. And, um, and, and so I got to thinking about, you know, this kind of market principle, this, this economic principle of valuation. Like, how do you actually put a value on something? Um, and, uh, and then, I don't know why. I know my, my mind works in strange ways. I started thinking about Beanie Babies. Do you remember, do you remember when that was a thing? Like, I felt like, like that was probably the turning point in our culture. Like, that was, that was you know, it's like, okay, we're, we're done for now. Uh, but, you know, I thought it was, this was just crazy that people would spend all this money on these little stuffed animal things. And, and, uh, and yet, and yet they would. Because something is worth exactly what? What somebody's willing to pay for it, right? That's how you value something. So think about this now. What are you worth? What are you worth to God? You are actually worth the life of His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You are worth that. I mean, if you could take all of the people in your life that value you, right? Just like if you could list out, all, here are all the people who value me, that, that I'm, I'm worth something to them. 
And you could even like rank it, like don't do it now in front of somebody. I mean, that could get awkward, but, but it, you know, if you could kind of like rank it and then, and then even put a, a, a quantity on it, like if somehow you could, you could quantify what, what their value is for you and you add it up from the first to the last, everybody's value on you, I'm telling you, and this is not, this is just true, this isn't my idea. It wouldn't even begin to touch. It wouldn't even begin to get close to how God values you. The immensity of the cost at which you were redeemed. We, we can't even begin to comprehend. You are like, you're like this, this one sheep. The shepherd had a hundred sheep and one of them got loose and got away and, and he went after it. It was worth that. You're like that, but you're even more. You, you're like... You're like one coin, there's a widow lady, she had 10 and this one coin, it got lost and she turned her house upside down. Why? Because she valued that one coin. You're like that, but you're even more. Do you know the only way that we could even begin is to get at God's value for us is Jesus says there was a father who had two sons and one of them was lost to him. And, and how desperately that father wanted that son back. The lengths to which he would go to have him back. You are loved you know the truth is we can't we can't allow other people to define our value we can't even allow ourselves to define our own value if you want to know what you're worth you look to Jesus Christ so we're loved and you know the other thing and this might sound you know really um, uh, like a contradiction when we get to this but you know what's really implied it's 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 indirect but what's really revealed here is that we are separated from God. You think about that, like, why would we need an Emmanuel? Why would we need God with us if we were already with God? What is implied here is that we are separated from God. This is the truth. We are. There is this distance that our sin opened up between us and God. And the thing about that distance is that it brings death, not just physical death, I'm talking about spiritual death because we are separated from God and He is life and life is in Him. But not only that, the other thing about this gulf, this, this, this gap, this separation, is that we can't bridge that gap. We can't, there's no way for us to get back to the other side. It is too wide. It is too deep. We, we can't get back to God. And, and so, if we are to make it back to God, He would have to come to us. You know, there's this thing that, that you hear sometimes in the culture is that all religions are the same. Probably you, you've heard that. I'm sure you have. And one of the images that, that they'll use to talk about this is that it's like we're all climbing a mountain, right? We're all climbing a mountain to get to God, and you take your path, and I take my path, and you're coming up the backside, and I'm over here, and somebody else is over there. But we're all going to make it to the top. I mean, we're all going to make it up to God. We're all just kind of going the same place. And I'll tell you, it really sounds, it sounds very like accommodating. It, it sounds very polite. We like to be polite. But the problem with it is, is that it is completely wrong. I mean, it is like 100% false. Couldn't be more false. And here's how you know. Where is that mountain? I mean, really, where is there a mountain? Where is there a way that we could actually climb up to force God to know us and be known by us? God is not some object that we can manipulate. God is God, and there is a gulf between us that we cannot bridge. I mean, like, where would you even start? Where would, what mountain would you climb to force God to be known? It is impossible. The only way that we could have God is if God comes to us. And in fact, He has in Jesus. He has come all the way, all the way for us to the extent that He would die for our sins, for that separation, to bridge the gap between us and God. He would bring us back, renew us in our relationship with God. And He rose again that if we put our faith in Him, we can actually know new birth. We can know a like a resurrection in our lives, being born of the Holy Spirit, we can actually live life. Life in abundance, life that is joyful, life that is whole in Him. And this really, this moves us to our last point, and, and that is about heaven. So we've, we've talked about what this means about God, what it means about us. Now let's talk about what it means about heaven, and that is, heaven is, heaven is, <laughs> heaven will be with the Lord, right? Heaven will be with the Lord. And, um, and I was thinking, you remember, you remember what Jesus says to the penitent criminal beside him on the cross? You remember? He says, he says, today you will be with me in paradise. 
And so I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm pulling that apart and I'm thinking, okay, what is the most important part of this phrase, of this declaration, of this assurance that God gives to this man who reaches to him? What is the most important thing? And, and we could think, okay, maybe it's the immediacy. He says today, right? That there's no waiting period, that, that purgatory is, listen, it is an unbiblical doctrine. There is nothing to this, this doctrine of purgatory that you hear about sometimes. Um, when we die in the Lord, did you know that we wake up in the presence of Jesus? Did you know that? <laughs> like no waiting, no line, immediately in the presence of of Jesus. And so we could think, wow, okay, well, maybe it's the immediacy that's the most important thing here. That's really awesome. Thanks be to God for that. But that's not the most important thing. Maybe we could think that, okay, maybe it's paradise. Like this fascinates me. Like out of any word that Jesus could use to talk about heaven, and he has full command of the entirety of the vocabulary of the human race, right? And of any word that he could use, he uses this one paradise. And he would know, right? He would know. This is his home. He would know what it's like. And when he describes it, he says that it's paradise. Maybe it's because it's paradise. But here, here's the thing. It's only paradise if it's with him. That's, it's only paradise if it's with him. And so really, the most important words in that phrase, those beautiful words that Jesus speaks to this penitent and criminal, today you will be with me in paradise. The most important words there are with me, with me me that is heaven that's why it's heaven that's why it's paradise because it is with him do you know um heaven is truly the goal of christians of the followers of jesus and what i mean by that is not it's not just i want to go to heaven when i die i don't want there to be any confusion i do <laughs> but that's not the full extent of what we mean when we say that heaven is our goal it's not just to get into heaven when we die. Our goal is to get heaven into us now. That is, that we want more of the presence of Jesus in our lives now. We want to know more of him now. We want deeper intimacy with him now. We want more of his love in us now. We want more of heaven in us at this very moment. Um, I, I, was, um, I was listening to this talk this amazing Christian philosopher, his name uh, was Dallas Willard. He went to be with the Lord a few years ago, but I was listening to what surely was, was his law, last um, public talk before he went to be with the Lord. And a couple of things really impressed me about this talk. One was that his voice, you could hear it, it was fading. He was terminally ill with cancer. You could hear that his voice was fading but you could also tell, as the scriptures say, that inwardly he was being renewed day by day. You could hear in his voice the hope of Jesus Christ, the strength of the Lord. And he said, he said, you know, it is possible that some people could get close, so close to Jesus. Their walk could be so close to him in this life that they barely notice when they walk from this life into the next with him. And I thought, may it be so in my life, Jesus. Lord, I want more and more of you. I want to fix my eyes on you so that, so that I will know more and more of heaven now. Now. You see, uh, Paul talks about in Philippians 2, his longing to go and be with the Lord. He says, to be with Christ, he says, would be far better for me. And the question is, far better than what? And the answer is everything. Because life is in Jesus. To be with him, to know him, to have more of him in our lives is everything. And here's the point for today. And if you kind of zoned out, come back, this is it. You might be thinking, man, why didn't you just give us that at the beginning? And we could have we been at lunch by now, y'all. But listen. Here's the point of today. If, if God would go to this extent to be with us, we can't take that for granted. And if God is willing to go that distance to be with us, 
doesn't it make sense that really the only thing that we could do with our lives in response to that is to make our lives a pursuit of him, to be with him, to know more of him, to give more of our lives to him so that we have more of him in us? Doesn't that make sense? It, I was thinking about the, the book of James, the brother of our Lord, how he says, come close to God and God will come close to you. Do you remember that? Come close to God and God will come close to you. And I thought, man, that's true, but the opposite also must be true. God has some, come so close to us, surely we must come close to him. So that our lives, our lives are swept up into the presence of the Lord and we might not even notice when we go from this life into the next with him. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you would, please pray with me. God, we do thank you and we give you praise because we know that without you we are lost and with you we have everything, Lord. To be with you, to know you, to walk with you, to have you in our hearts dwelling, in our hearts through faith, Lord, it is everything, everything. It is life to us. And so, Lord, we set our eyes on the things of heaven. We want more of you and less of us. And so, Lord, draw us to yourself. Set our hearts on fire for you, Lord. And and we pray for this earnestly, Lord, because we love you. We love you. We pray for it in Jesus' name. And together we say, amen. Amen.